West Memphis, Arkansas was known for being a pretty dangerous area in the Bible Belt of America. But one May evening in 1993, it got even more dangerous. Three young boys were playing outside when they were abducted and slain. Three men were convicted for the crime, but there wasn't really any solid evidence against them. Almost 20 years later, the three guys were released from jail after new information came up about the crazy, flesh-eating turtles. Steve, Michael, and Christopher were all eight-year-old boys living in West Memphis. They went to the same school and participated in Cub Scouts. So basically, they were ultimate BFFs. One evening, they went to go play outside as they normally did. But this time was different because they would never return. They went to go play in an area called Robin Hood Hills. But as it got later and later, one of the boys' dads started to panic. At 7 p.m., Christopher's adoptive dad called the police to report the boys as missing. There was a search that night conducted by the police as well as the boys' family and concerned neighbors, but no one could find them anywhere. That morning, investigators continued to search the Robin Hood Hills area, but had no luck. But a few hours later, an officer noticed a boy's black shoe floating in the muddy creek. The officer got into the creek and felt something was on his foot. It was one of the boys' bodies. Shortly after that, two other boys' corpses were found in the creek as well. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to be that loud. All three boys didn't have any clothes on and their limbs were tied together with their shoelaces. Okay, so whoever did this is a terrible human who in their right mind would do this to one little kid, let alone three. After the bodies were recovered, investigators continued to look in the surrounding area for more evidence. They found the victim's clothes, but they were all turned inside out. They also found some hairs and a few fibers that became pretty controversial evidence later in the investigation. There were no drag marks found on the ground, and after doing a luminal test, officials determined the boys had been attacked in the same spot that they were found. Autopsies were performed, and the examiner determined Christopher's passing was from multiple blade injuries. Michael and Stephen were also badly injured, but they were eventually taken out after being immersed in water. I'll spare you the details, but Michael had a bunch of really awful injuries. Super awful, like super, super awful. Okay, you get the point. Investigators immediately believed that this was the work of more than one person because all the boys had been tied up a bit differently. Once the word got out, the people of West Memphis were devastated. Yeah, I am too. They were also super freaked out and theorized the crime was some sort of satanic ritual based on how brutal the whole scene was. Once this theory was tossed out, people in the community started throwing out names of people who they thought could have performed the act. West Memphis was a super conservative small town, so people were quick to point fingers at an 18-year-old high school dropout named Damien. Damien was often seen wearing all black, he loved listening to heavy metal music, and was super into horror. He also lived in a trailer park and allegedly studied Wicca, which is some sort of witchcraft. So the God-fearing people of West Memphis weren't really a fan of this dude and jumped to the conclusion that he was responsible. Okay, so I am all for exhausting every possible suspect, but I don't think these people had a reason for accusing Damien other than the fact that he wasn't into the Lord like they were. But then again, the whole witchcraft thing is definitely suspicious. I do not mess with that stuff. You know what I mean? So at first the cops had no real reason to go after Damien until someone called to rat him out. Damien's girlfriend's aunt called the police and reported seeing Damien around the crime scene around 9 p.m. She said he was covered in mud. Okay, that's some tea. I don't know any 18 year olds who like playing in the mud for fun, so something sketchy is definitely going on. Well, unless the woman hated her niece's boyfriend and just made up the story in hopes he would be arrested and removed from her life, Anyways, after this woman called the cops on Damien, he was the first on the suspect list. The cops started to vet him and see if they could gather any clues and possibly connect him to the crime. They quickly found out that Damien had been previously arrested for petty crimes like vandalism and shoplifting. He had also spent some time in an institution for mental health issues. He was having so much trouble with his mental health, he felt he was unable to work and applied to receive disability checks from the government. His mental health record is apparently 500 pages long. He was said to suffer from delusions, hallucinations, mood swings, and disordered thought process. 
When Damien was questioned by the police, he said he had nothing to do with the crimes, but his alibi was a bit suspicious and it never really checked out. He said he was with other people that night, but those people never confirmed that he was actually with them. Damien's grandma actually reported to the police that her grandson was out around the time of the incident. All right, so things aren't looking so hot for this guy. But Damien wasn't the only person pinned as a suspect. Shortly after his actions were brought into question, investigators quickly added two other men to their suspect list. 17-year-old boy Jesse and 16-year-old Jason. Jason and Damien were both friends, but they weren't really as close with Jesse. All three men had similar taste in music and hobbies, and they had a knack for violence. Jesse had also dropped out of high school, where he was known for getting in fistfights and having a short temper. Jason was super smart, and he had a talent for drawing and sketching. He was so good at art that one of his teachers encouraged him to go to school for graphic design. Aside from those three teenagers, the officials did thoroughly investigate two other suspects, including one who drove an ice cream truck. Yeah, an ice cream truck driver automatically gives him horror movie vibes. The ice cream truck dude's story is pretty suspect. He said he wasn't involved at first, but later in an interview, he claimed he had a history of blackouts and memory lapses, and he said he might have slain the victims, but quickly took that back in part of his statement. Um, okay, did he low-key just admit to whacking those kids? Like, you can't just take back these a statement like that. Somehow, the ice cream dude was ruled out. His recanted statement was ruled out as evidence in his trial, and there was no physical evidence that connected him to the crime. I don't know, I still think that dude is super iffy. But let's get back to the three main dudes, Damien, Jesse, and Jason. On June 3rd, Jesse was interrogated by himself and waived his right to a lawyer. Investigators questioned him for almost 12 hours. 12 hours, that was a lot of talking to do. Like how did they not lose their voices at that point? So during these 12 hours, Jesse confessed to being involved in the slayings and said Damien and Jason were part of it too. The frustrating thing about Jesse's confession is that only 46 minutes of the 12 hour interrogation was recorded. In the recording, Jesse told investigators that he watched Damien and Jason beat and physically violate the boys. He also said he helped hold back one of the kids when he tried to run away. But after that, Jesse took everything back and said he didn't do it because he was at a wrestling match when the event took place. Why is everyone claiming things and then going back on their statements? It's not that hard to just tell the truth the first time. Over the course of multiple interviews, Jesse confessed quite a few times, but each time he did, the story was a little different. He was given a polygraph test, and when he confessed, he actually failed the test. But Jesse eventually recanted his statement and claimed he only admitted to the crime because the interrogators put a lot of pressure on him. He said he felt coerced to confess. Okay, so I'm lost here. Did he do it or did he not do it? I have no idea what to believe. As if things aren't already confusing AF, things get even trickier. So Jesse had an IQ of 72, which was super low. His score actually categorized him as borderline intellectual functioning. So it is argued that his mental capacity rendered his confession involuntary. But his back and forth confession was enough because in February of 1995, Jesse was convicted and found guilty for one of the boys' executions in the first degree and the two other boys in the second degree. He was sentenced to life in prison. The Arkansas Supreme Court ended up ruling Jesse's confession as voluntary because he was read his Miranda rights. Three weeks after Jesse's trial, Damien and Jason had theirs. The prosecutors accused the two men of committing the crimes with Jesse as some sort of satanic performance. There were a few injuries found on the victims that appeared to hint at some sort of ritualistic practice. But something a bit off about this claim is that while the teens were supposedly into paganism and witchcraft, there was no other evidence that proved the crime was rooted in those practices aside from some of the injuries. Like there weren't any symbols or anything witchy left behind. I'm not saying they didn't do it, but it was a bit of a stretch that they tried to tie the crime to Satanism. A lot of people who followed this case believed that this connection was prematurely made because the people of West Memphis were all pretty religious. Some other case elements highlighted by the prosecution were fibers found at the crime scene and a blade that the investigators discovered in a pond near Jason's trailer park. So when the three corpses were found, investigators connected a few green fibers at the scene that were similar to the material of one of Damien's shirts. There were also red fibers that resembled the fabric from a bathrobe found at Jason's house. They were never really clear if they were an exact match, but it definitely seemed suspicious. 
The shank that was found by Jason's place also caused a bunch of confusion. When the blade was recovered from the lake, Damien's ex-girlfriend told officials that it looked like the one her ex had. She said his was unique because it had a compass at the end. During the trial, some blade-loving professional testified that the weapon found in the lake had missing compass. But there was no way to determine this was the same weapon. And considering the officials got their information from Damien's ex, that's a bit shaky. Also though, that would be some pretty hardcore revenge if that girl made up her claim to get back at Damien. I mean, my brother ate all of my Halloween candy once and I threw away all of his Pokemon cards, but that's the extent of my revenge. On the other side of the argument, the defense claimed that there just wasn't enough proof that the three men were guilty. There wasn't any DNA evidence and all the dirt the prosecution had against the men were suspicious, but never fully connected them to the incident. In the end, Damien and Jason were both found guilty on all three counts. Jason was sentenced to life without parole and Damien was sentenced to be terminated. <laughs> After the decision was made, there was quite an uproar about the sentencing of these three teens, who are commonly referred to as the West Memphis Three. So people were upset that these guys were convicted without any real physical evidence. They thought it was wrong that they were profiled due to their dark hobbies and taste in music. Some case followers thought that Jesse's confession was forced by investigators, and there was even accusations made about jury misconduct. <laughs> In 1996, an HBO documentary was released about the case. The film exposed the lack of evidence and the official's questionable investigation tactics. The doc theorized that the West Memphis Three were victims of what is called Satanic Panic, which was a huge movement that started in the 80s where people were super fearful of Satanism and believed it would harm society. So people were all bent up about the whole conviction. Some people were relieved that the perps had been arrested and charged, and others thought the three men were wrongly convicted because of their interests. But this belief extended beyond the general population. Celebrities, musicians, and activists spoke up about their belief that the West Memphis Three were innocent. There were even two tribute albums released to raise funds for the three dudes' legal costs. So while after the convictions, Damien, Jason, and Jesse submitted imprints of their teeth to be tested against a supposed bite mark found on one of the victims. And the sketchy part about the bite mark is that it wasn't found in the original autopsy or trial. Okay, so either the medical examiner wasn't very thorough or a bite mark supposedly appeared out of nowhere. Well, whatever the deal was with this bite mark, none of the perp's imprints were a match. In 2003, a woman whose testimony played a big role in the convictions took back her whole statement. Um, okay, so this lady just decides to casually change her mind about a serious accusation 10 years after the incident. What's going on? But things get even crazier. In 2007, the piece of hair found at the crime scene was tested against Damien, Jason, and Jesse's DNA. There were no matches. But the hair was consistent with the DNA of one of the victim's stepfathers. There was another hair found on a tree stump near the scene that was consistent with the DNA of the stepdad's friend. Officials believe that the crime was committed by multiple people, so he could have been an accomplice to the stepdad. But I guess the investigators weren't really concerned because they never named them as suspects. Okay, so the three men are convicted with no real evidence, and now these two men are connected to the scene with DNA evidence. And they're not even suspects. This is ridiculous. After the whole hair DNA thing came out, something else is super puzzling. So the creek that the boys' bodies were found in had these turtles that were known for biting flesh. Anyways, the marks that these turtles left on human flesh looked just like the injuries found on the little boys. Because of that, these turtle experts said that the victims were all still slain by a terrible human or group of humans, but the injuries that the prosecution tried to tie to a cult practice weren't completely valid. Why is this stuff just now coming up? Like, how did these people just miss a bunch of vicious turtles? In 2010, a new evidentiary hearing was ordered by the Arkansas Supreme Court where prosecutors then offered the West Memphis Three a deal called the Alford Plea. The plea let the defendant maintain innocence, but they had to acknowledge that the state had enough evidence to prove their guilt. Basically, they had to say, I didn't commit the crime, but I can see why people think I did. Which is so strange, but whatever. After the whole plea deal, the three were sentenced to the time they had already served and were released. In 2012, the fibers from the scene were re-examined and tested against Damien's shirt and Jason's robe. They were not a match. 
but the fibers weren't in good enough shape since so much time had already passed. They can't really tell much, and the people who tested the fibers were paid for by the defense, so once again, we run into more confusion than we do clarity. The West Memphis Three are now all free and no further arrests have been made in the little boy's case. Well, considering the stepdad's hair was found at the scene, I feel like officials should have done more to investigate him as a suspect. And what about that ice cream truck driver? He literally said he might have committed the crime. In the end, three innocent boys were horrifically taken out and their friends and family had to deal with the tragic loss forever. Let's take a moment to honor Steve, Michael, and Christopher. Well, I think that's enough crime for today. I'm ready to move on to a lighter topic, like cheesecake. Thanks for watching.